What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here and today we're going to be reacting to The Debunkers Destroy Vox's Universal Child Care Propaganda. So this is from Freedom Tunes and it might be the longest Freedom Tunes video ever. It's definitely the longest one I've ever seen by them, it's 27 minutes. These guys usually, well I guess Seamus, because I think it's just Seamus and then occasionally get people to do voice acting. Uh, but he usually drops videos that are anywhere from like 40 seconds to like maybe 3 to 5 minutes long. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is by far his longest video ever. Even the other debunkers videos I've seen have only been about 15 minutes long. But anyway, link to the original video down below. Remember to like, comment, subscribe to help the algorithm. And let's jump into it, see what we have here. I'm sure being from Vox, it's going to be amazing because Vox is uh, an absolute cringe fest, to say the least. Intellectual. As am I. The two of us are sick of dealing with troglodytes, and so we moved into a bomb shelter so we wouldn't catch the stupid. Now we pass our intelligence on by debunking YouTube videos. We are the, the debunkers. In war towns all over the United States, women are called upon to leave their homes and take jobs. Women in the workforce? Yes, war calls for many horrendous things. During World War II, <laughs> nearly one in three American men went off to war, and women were expected to take their place at work. Note, they did not take men's place on the battlefield, because even though desperate times called for desperate measures, they still recognized distinct reason-based gender roles were paramount, and that women and men can't simply be replaced by one another. They discover that factory work is usually no more difficult than housework. No more difficult than housework? Ah, yes, of course, because 75,000 people were deadly or permanently and totally disabled between 1942 and 1945 in household accidents. No, wait, those were industrial accidents. Ah, so industrial work was far more difficult and dangerous for women than household work. Who could have imagined? Isn't this pretty hot for you? Well, I hear it gets kind of hot around the kitchen stove, too. A tough 1940s woman saying something to downplay the safety concerns and difficulties surrounding her job doesn't mean it wasn't difficult or was safe. Also, please do not compare this brave woman to the working women who lefties promote today. Hot off. Yeah, not only, not only that, but a big factor when it comes to that is that was probably... I, I don't know the context of the original video that, that Vox is referencing there, but I'm assuming it was literally some fucking propaganda film by either the US government for the war effort or by that corporation in order to get more employees. Office, it gets hot around a stove too. Air conditioning is sexist. <laughs> the problem was, who was going to watch Rosie the Riveter's kids? When married women with small children have to take jobs, everything possible will be done to provide day care for the children. For 50 cents a day, which would be about $8 now, mothers could leave their kids at a government-funded daycare center. Wow, well, children being raised by complete strangers at daycare centers was something we did out of sheer necessity at one of the most desperate points in global history, so it's probably a good and cool thing that we should keep doing forever now. And not to be pedantic, but it's not $8 in today's money. It's closer to 10 Thanks, Joe Biden. Lunch <laughs> was included. Yeah, not only that, but you have to remember, like, back then, people were a lot more familiar with their communities. You probably would have known who was doing that, right? Even in cities, like, cities back then, from what I've read, at least, had much more of a small-town feel than cities today do. Obviously, a small town today, like, you know, you'd know who was at your daycare, who was taking care of the kids and all that. But even back then in the city, because of everyone going to church and everyone being involved in the community, people would be much, much more aware of who was doing it. It wasn't like some random stranger. You know, it was probably someone you knew or someone that you knew knew them. Once again, this was part of a war effort, not a feel-good progressive agenda. The nations which established childcare programs were predominantly those involved in the Second World War, the USSR being one of the biggest players. This was never intended to be a long-term solution. It had to occur because by and large, the family structure was no longer intact due to fathers leaving the household to fight in the war. It was a crutch for the broken family, not a better option. 
Like emergency rations when food runs out, the idea is to return to a nutritious diet as soon as possible. Unfortunately to Vox, the goal wasn't to eventually leave the system behind and return to the family, but to leave the family behind and return to this system. America actually set up universal childcare for working mothers. Canada and other countries did too. Around half a million American children attended these centers. What is their source here? Our figures show the U.S. National Child Care Service cared for only 139,000 children at its peak, despite the large number of mothers in the workforce. If you divide half a million by the 2,200 daycare centers, that's 200 kids at each daycare center, which isn't impossible, but seems like a stretch. <laughs> But when the war ended, things returned to normal and children were raised by their parents again. Joy is unconfined. So did the daycare. Families protested, calling for the centers to be permanent. But the federal funding stopped in 1946. Well, yes, because the war ended. The need for a total war. Um, what do we got here? How much can my family afford on relief? Save our nursery. Don't push us into the streets. If a mom can't work, we can't eat. Stop nursery elimination. Child care makes good citizens. Uh, victors say child care makes more, makes good citizens. That's funny. Our economy no longer existed. That's not an injustice. It's a good thing. These freaks saw the family structure being subverted by total warfare and were like, oh man, I'm so... Sad that that ended. Do you think women should have needlessly stayed in those dangerous jobs while their children were raised by someone else? Oh, what am I asking? Of course she does. What's so insidious about this is that it was at a time where it was still the status quo for a single breadwinner to earn the income for a family. There was absolutely no reason to accommodate mothers leaving the home. It would literally do nothing but take them from their children to line some industrial factory owner's pockets. And you're lamenting that it wasn't made more possible by the post-war government. Yeah, and that's one of the things I find kind of funny about the whole women's rights to, right to work movement in general is you, you see it kind of paired with the idea that like you shouldn't be controlled by your husband. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have a healthy, happy family and be, you know, have this man at home and all of this stuff because, you know, or be at home for a man and his children. Because that's, you know, giving into the patriarchy and you're basically a slave. What you should go do is be a slave for some rich corporation instead. Because it's much more fulfilling even though you'll die fucking childless and alone. Uh, and then on top of that, there's also the whole fact that one of the biggest reasons for wage depression over the last... Or I guess not really depression, but lack of wage growth over the past couple decades is because women have moved increasingly into the workforce to the point where... You get to the 80s and 90s, depending on where you live, and essentially all women are in the workforce. And even though there's been massive economic growth, you doubled the labor force, so you've basically halved the value of labor, right? So until the economy literally doubles in the size from what it was in the 90s, you're not going to have wage growth, at least not any meaningful wage growth. Oh, I'm muted. And so the U.S. missed that start to begin a climb towards other childcare policies. I think you missed the start of the video where it was clear that universal childcare was part of the war effort and not a progressive agenda. It's obsolete unless your goal is to destroy the family. So I get why you like it, but come on, try to frame this more honestly. Other countries didn't. Canada had the same protest and some provinces decided to keep their centers open. Very foolishly indeed. That decision started them down a path where it was easy to implement other government-run policies. Other wonderful policies which usurped the role of the family, the fundamental building block of human civilization. Exactly. We're supposed to take for granted that this Canadian method of doing things is superior, but for what reason would we ever assume that? We shouldn't. And in fact, there's good data to help us reach the opposite conclusion. In 1997, Quebec launched full-day, year-round childcare for all kids under the age of five. The title of its policy brief read, Children at the Heart of Our Choice, but in French. 
Gross. The assumption, <laughs> of course, was that such a program would give children a leg up while enabling many more mothers to enter the workforce and make that cash money. But within 10 years, various different analyses proved this was far from true. Social development among children, as indicated by both emotional and behavioral measures, had significantly deteriorated in Quebec relative to the rest of Canada. 10% of a standard deviation lower. In fact, according to other figures, by age four and a half, extensive hours in daycare predicted negative social outcomes in every area, including social competence, externalizing problems, and adult child conflict generally at a rate three times higher than other children. And analyses of self-reported general health and life satisfaction indicated that negative social-emotional outcomes associated with exposure to the daycare program persisted into young adulthood. And in some cases, these negative effects became even stronger over time, as indicated by a 24% of a standard deviation increase in anxiety, a 19% increase in aggression, and a 13% increase in hyperactivity. The impact on boys and children with the most elevated behavior problems was stronger, especially in measures of hyperactivity and aggression. This information is largely consistent with findings from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development's comprehensive evaluation of daycare in the U.S., which found that extensive hours in daycare in early life predicted negative behavioral outcomes throughout development, including in the final assessments done when the children were 15 years old. Family economic status, maternal education, quality of child care, and caregiver closeness did not moderate these effects. Perhaps a bit of an info dump, so to put it more briefly, the U.S. did technically miss out, in the same sense that somebody who dodges a bullet does. <laughs> I'm curious to know, what do behavioral problems in Canada look like? Slightly less polite? So, how did- You can tell they're not familiar with the Quebecois. They're known for being fucking assholes. I mean, Quebec is... It, it's known, like... It's literally known for being the fucking, the absolute, like, worst place to go in Canada for, like, the the people. The, the, the buildings look fucking gorgeous. It's got, like, a lot of, like, old school European architecture. But the people there, like, oh, uh, yeah. How did the U.S. end up here? Here are some of the richest countries in the world. And here's when each of them established a paid maternity leave policy. If it's what rich people are doing, it must be a good idea. And a universal childcare policy. And let's throw in paid paternity leave for good measure. In France, they've actually had some form of universal childcare since the 1800s, but formalized the system in 1945. And you know what they say. Always emulate the people who you had to save in both world wars. Yeah. <laughs> Sweden, considered to have one of the best systems in the world, they were the first to guarantee paid paternity leave. And they've provided full childcare for all children. Man, for, to pretend that Sweden is the best system in the world while they're being conquered by people they led into their own country is fucking hilarious. Since 1985. Uh. Uh, once again, we encounter the myth of the Nordic socialist utopias. These are never apples to apples comparisons, so let's point out some of the major differences between Sweden and the US. Sweden has a population which is around 3% of America's, and 87% of their population lives within just 1.5% of the entire land area. They also have a highly centralized government. In other words, even if we wanted to adopt their system, we couldn't. But we shouldn't want to. Here's why. Sweden has the highest maternal employment rate in the world at 83%. And according to Carolyn Hoagland, Secretary of the European Federation of Parents and Caregivers, quote, Child care started as a widening of choices, and now it is seen as the only socially acceptable choice. So the developmental child care was a way for mothers and fathers to be able to work outside the home to raise GDP. Nearly all children in Sweden are enrolled in preschool starting at 12 to 18 months. The norm to do exactly that has become very strong. Staying at home with your child longer than the norm of about a year is not only difficult financially, but socially as well. She goes on to describe how people who want to stay with their children longer than that are often chastised for not contributing to society. That's right, because of this wonderfully utopian childcare system, 
Children are enrolled in an early preschool system at 12 to 18 months, and staying home with your child for anything over than that year or so is extremely difficult. That's a hellscape. A creepy, dystopian, bizarre, heartless, icy hellscape. <laughs> I love when one of the richest nations in the world prioritizes turning women into an economic unit rather than allowing them to be mothers and the warm socialist utopians of the US want to encourage us to emulate this. I want to be clear, stripping children from their mothers when they're barely a year old isn't a quirky or different policy position we should be open-minded about or even discussing. It's evil. Sweden's childcare system sucks. They should be ashamed. So as for the thing about viewing women as an economic unit, I mean, that's largely true of all Western societies. I wouldn't even criticize Sweden specifically for that because maybe they're the worst offenders in a way. But that's how all Western societies view women nowadays, right? And you can see that in the way they, you know, they anything that has traditionally been a woman's role in society is degraded and viewed as, you know, demeaning and disgusting and you know lazy and pathetic and all these different things right like to be a traditional woman is ba you're basically ostracized from a large portion of society despite the fact that it's you know history and studies have shown that the the kids are going to end up better for it right that it's one of the most important roles we should have in society and should be trying to you know glorify in society uh, and on top of, you know, and that basically anything men traditionally did is, like, very good and all of this stuff, right? That is, like, the you know, the great aspirations of, of men, but also it's sexist to say that. And, you know, it's, it's this very ideologically inco incoherent. Uh, and a lot of it is just to do with basically, uh, you know, again, this is my one critique of capitalism, or my biggest critique of capitalism, I should say, as a right-winger, is capitalism tricked women into the workforce, and it's done a very effective job through marketing campaigns of doing that. And they continue to do so. And they use the useful idiots that are socialists to do it. And now a quick word from our sponsor. You know, the same kinds of people making the bogus claims we're debunking happen to write a lot of the news you consume. How could you avoid the fate of being trapped in their web of misinformation? With Ground News! Are you fat and ugly and bitter and bad at deciphering media bias? Ground News can help you solve one of those problems. It'll make <laughs> you skinnier? Oh. Ground News is the world's first news comparison platform. It allows you to sort through different news stories and see how the left reports on things as opposed to the right, making you a fat checking whiz you'll definitely what do, want to check what out do we got here what wait, wait go back go back what do we got here how do they reports on things as opposed to the right making you a fact checking whiz you'll definitely wait. want to okay I, <clears throat> um is that the w <clears throat> is that the washington post Washington Post logo. Okay, no, Washington. What is that W logo? Because, yeah, I'm looking at these and, like, some of them... Like, the fact that Wall Street Journal is right here. Wall Street Journal has done hit pieces on right-wingers for calling them Nazis before. I would put them at least over here, if not over here. Um, New York Post, I think that's fair. Yeah, I, I, like the ones that I'm aware of, they all seem relatively accurate. BBC News. Bro, BBC News should be, like, over fucking here. Politico should be over another one, too. Yeah, a lot of these I would not say are accurate in where they have them placed. 
check out the blind spot feature. It's an extremely useful tool that shows you specific stories that have gone underreported by the left or right. Like this story on how 41% of small businesses can't pay rent this month. If you scroll down a little further, you can see each of the news outlets that have reported on the story, as well as each of the source's headlines and their political bias rating. You may be our mother's least favorite child, but at least now you have the opportunity to own her golden boy with facts and logic next time you're home for the holidays. <laughs> Speaking of the holidays, Ground News is still running their Black Friday sale. To get 40% off a Vantage subscription, go to ground.news slash freedom tunes by December 2nd. That's ground.news slash freedom tunes. T-O-O-N-S. Now back to the debunking. You'll notice the U.S. has none of these policies. Technically, there is a 12-week maternity leave policy. It's just not paid. That's up to your employer. And a few states offer preschool, and there are some child care programs, but they're mostly for low-income families and far from universal. For whom else should it be? Who on earth would we expect to want to leave their children with complete strangers other than those who are too destitute to have any other option? Also, this is dishonest framing. While all EU member nations provide support to reduce the cost of childcare for children below school age, they do so to varying degrees and with different policy mixes. Childcare in the US right now is very fragmented. Well, in a nation of 330 million people living across 50 states, I don't know what else you would expect it to be. There are different programs that function for different purposes and often work against each other. Take a closer look at this chart. After World War II was a popular time for these childcare policies, but so was the 70s. Ah, yes. When did we ever make clearer decisions as a civilization than directly after World War II and during the 70s? Yeah, I love it. The, the the fucking the cultural revolution which has been the decline of western civilization and she's using it as an example of what is good about this time period like bruh the lack of fucking self-awareness the early 70s were a time for women's rights women's rights is the pr term the sexual revolution landed on for convincing women to participate in their own debasement equal employment laws had just passed divorce laws were loosened told ya and many countries established universal childcare policies. Because, once again, the West was entrenched in civilization destroying warfare. This time, the sexual revolution, which left the family destroyed in a way far more drastic and irreversible than any weapon of the Second World War could have. And True, 100%, and it was literally Soviet propaganda. They overtook the educational institutions. We were warned about it 20 years before by defector KGB agents. We did nothing to fucking stop it. They took over the educational institutions. They indoctrinated all of the fucking young adults and teenagers that were in those educational institutions. And now, the indoctrinated adults are running everything. And that's why everything's off the fucking deep end now. It is a direct result of the fucking 70s. The decline of Western power over the last 60, 70 years has been a result of this happening or i guess 50 years sorry is a result of this and they're trying to use it as an example of what is good about this movement and this time universal child care systems were placed there not to pick up the pieces of a broken family structure they were hoping to repair but to blow a more functioning family structure into millions of little pieces it almost happened in the u.s too Almost. What happened in 1971 is th there was obviously a sense that we needed to do something about child care. We had to do something about child care. That thing humans had a perfect method of handling for literally all of history up until that point. You don't understand. We had to invent the wheel. It had never been invented before. <laughs> Congress actually acted. Both the House and the Senate passed the Comprehensive Child Development Act. This was a really extraordinary bill because it would have provided universal child care. It would not have been stigmatized in the same way that welfare programs would have been. It would have been available to a much wider group of families. I highly doubt it wouldn't have been stigmatized, especially at the time. You have to remember, the, the hippie movement at the time was not very popular. It was just in universities and shit. You could actually look at it a lot of the way, similar to like something like Antifa now. 
right? It was very similar to the hippie movement at the time. And I'm sure that we'll fucking have people in 20 years once the Republicans are, you know, the fucking talking about the, how the Democrats are the real anti-Antifa and the fucking, you know, the Democrats are the real pedophobes because they're fucking spineless bastards. But in 20 fucking years, they'll probably be making movies about, you know, the summer of love with Antifa, you know, when all the buildings were burning down. And, you know, you'll have, I'm a George Floyd conservative, you know, like, fuck me. But then, President Richard Nixon vetoed it. Good. No one expected the veto. A terrible shock. If Brexit or 2016 or anything else that they were blindsided by is any indication, no one expected the veto most likely means we didn't expect the veto, but everyone in touch with what the common person wants could have seen it coming a mile away. Yeah. His veto message said that this is going to create communal child care. It would Sovietize the American family. All very good points. I love how every time anti-communism is given as a reason for doing something, the left responds as if communism literally just never existed and was invented by evil Republicans to have more excuses to be mean. This was during the 1970s. Communism was a pretty significant existential threat. It still is. But it really was then. Communists were in control of one of the largest nations in the world. I'd, I'd argue it's a bigger threat now because even though China doesn't believe in it, really, they still pay a lot of lip service to it, and you're starting to see them crack down and try to re-communize the country. Um, <clears throat> and they're they're a bigger threat than Russia ever was was ever able to be. Uh, so that's factor number one. And then factor number two is. Now they're in all the positions of power within our own government, right? Now they run one of the major political parties. They have a lot of influence in within one of the other major political parties. They run the entirety of Hollywood. They run a large percentage of major corporations, funnily enough. They run all the, like, the major media, all the major social media. They run all the educational institutions. Like They've taken over every aspect of higher society. Now, to be fair, you could argue that was because of the Soviets, because, you know, they did plan on this by overtaking the educational institutions back in the 70s. It started in the 50s, was finished by the 70s. But I would argue it's as big of a threat now, if not a bigger threat now. World and had actual nukes. And they didn't suffer from dementia, like today's communist leader who's in charge of a massive nation and has access to nukes. That language was a response to criticism that he was going soft on communism, like by visiting China. Ah, uh, here's the part where we don't refute his argument, but try instead to find motivations for him to have made it, which have nothing to do with the topic being discussed. But really, the right wing began to see this as an encroachment because it could be used potentially by white middle class families in order to support women leaving the home and going out into the workforce. Yes, that's what he said, communism. Because it could be used potentially by white middle class families in order to support women leaving the home and going out into the workforce. No, that's not what it could do. That's its express purpose and the entire reason why you support it. They're not supposed to be working. No, they aren't. And all of the data make that perfectly clear. Daycare is absolutely horrible for children. But rather than confronting the fact that your reinvention of the wheel does nothing but hurt children, you cling to your outdated egalitarian fantasies and assume the rest of us should take them for granted as well, when they've brought nothing but harm and destruction to the most vulnerable among us. Exactly. Daycare produces less socially well-adjusted children than homes where they're with their mother. Explain to me why mothers should be out working when we know this is the case, without chortling about how knowing anything about what the data says makes one a retrograde chauvinist. We do want to make, you know, poor black and brown indigenous mothers like- What? Okay, she's just writing fanfic at this point. <laughs> no, she, she, this is just part of their intersectionalist ideology. Right, they have to pay lip service to this. You know, the last video we watched was the Alex Hexagon video about you know atheism as a religion, and I, and I said no, I don't think so. I think again, it has to do with intersectionalism as the religion, atheism as a tenant. This is another tenant of that religion. She has to pay lip service to those things. President Nixon, there are zero flaws with daycare. We should universalize it. Absolutely not. I hate indigenous women too much. 
<laughs> he doesn't have an argument for why daycare is an acceptable place to abandon your child at for the entire day when you have any other options. So not only does she need to resort to calling us sexist for disagreeing with her, she pulls out the big guns and says we're racist too. Can I ask a genuine question to this woman? If you ever happen to watch this, uh, how many of my policy positions on a day-to-day -day basis do you think I go about defining based on a hatred for indigenous women. Like, how, <laughs> what place in my head do you think that occupies? Do you think I'm like going around hearing about the issues and going, I could pick this side, <laughs> but then what kind of hatred for indigenous women would I be expressing? The, the funny thing is like, they've actually done studies on this where they get left wingers, right wingers and centrists to try and guess what the different factions will be saying on something else. So they try to get the uh, right winger to guess what the centrist and the left winger will think. They get the centrist to guess what the right winger and left winger will think. And they get the left winger to guess what the centrist and the right winger will think. The, the right winger and the centrist are almost always accurately able to predict what the other two are going to think. The leftist is almost never able to predict what the other people are going to think. Because they part of it has to do with like their own ideology because they it is a it is much more like a religion than it is an ideology and so they have tenets that they're told that you have to think right so they have to think of you as evil like you would think of a satanist as evil if you're a christian right so that's a big factor they view all right wingers as essentially the same way a christian would view a satanist so you have to think these evil things because you're a satanist right so that's a big factor the other thing is they're just not like they're never forced to view left-wing political opinions or sorry right-wing political opinions right the centrist is obviously getting them somehow or is just around right-wingers um the the right-winger obviously like you can't avoid it right whether it be hollywood or the music industry or social media or four to the five major media corporations in the united states the educational institutions most major corporations if you're if you're a right-winger you're 100 percent gonna have to hear left-wing talking points if you're a left-winger you can completely avoid them and never hear them once in your life you don't have to, right? It's it's very easy to avoid because uh, most of the time they're going to be banned off of social media. They're not going to be on most major media networks. They're not they're not in Hollywood. They're not in the music industry. They're not. Uh, no, I mean I guess Elon owns Twitter now, but prior to that, they they weren't owning social media sites. They weren't they they weren't in educational institutions, right? So it, I, I'm not surprised at all that she has no idea what right wingers think. It makes perfect sense. Why would she? She's had no reason to ever know that and she looks like she's maybe i'm gonna guess in her late 30s early 40s so she she was in the you know the university system probably in like the mid 2000s to late 2000s maybe the early 2010s it, it had already been taken over for by that point for like three four decades right by that point there, there were you know you'd be lucky to have one right-wing professor like i'm not surprised at all those are the non-deserving kinds of mothers that shouldn't be on welfare, they should be working. How can she be this obtuse? The conservative argument isn't that black mothers should be working and white ones shouldn't. In fact, it's no argument at all. And even if that was the argument, then why wouldn't they want universal daycare for them? Right? You would you would actually have an argument. Like the you would actually have an argument if this is something that like conservatives try to push universal child care but just for blacks or just for natives or something like that you would have an argument right they clearly want to destroy the black family but they don't right this is one of the things i find funny is like you know people always say like oh the you know the alt-right is anti-abortion it's like they're actually not they're the alt-right like the actual alt-right neo-nazis are pro-abortion because ethnic minorities get them at disproportionate numbers right it Oh my god, it, it makes no sense. Like the, the the lack of logical consistency here. Right? It, it's so funny. It's like on one hand, you you hate white women and you don't want them working, therefore no child care. You hate black women and you want them working, therefore no child care. Right? These two things can't be both true at the same time. It's a simple statement of basic fact. Men should provide for their wives and children. And a system which does anything to usurp that role is a broken one. 
She doesn't cite a single source for any of her radical claims, though that shouldn't be a shock, because if she was big into the whole having sources thing, she wouldn't be in favor of daycare in the first place. No, 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 no. None of those studies matter. For you see, we've been called racist. Ah, yes. I thought I believed daycare was bad, because by every metric it leads to worse outcomes for children, but it turns out I just hate those Cherokee women so much. I, I just, I, not to harp on this too much, right, but I love when people say actually it was racism, smugly, as if they've, like, proven anything. I, look at the way she says that. Like, she's just, like, weaved this grand narrative and surprised us with the plot twist. How smug. You didn't make a point. It's a standard left-wing throat clearing. Everything's racist. Yeah. All it is is an ad hominem, and it's not actually based on any reality most of the time. It's literally just something they made up as an attempt to insult them because they can't actually argue against the point, right? Because because here's the thing, right? Nixon said it was because he was worried about communism, and this girl has openly said that she's a leftist and she's self she's identified herself by you know talking about black and indigenous issues and all this other shit, right? She's outed herself as an interse intersectionalist, so she can't argue that point on its merit because yeah. That's true. That's why they want it now, too, is because it's going to lead towards socialism and communism, right? It's fucking hilarious. Schlafly led that opposition. Based. Women whose husbands have left them or divorced them or whatever have a very hard time. But when you look at, at these wives uh, who simply want a standard of living higher than their husband is producing, crying around that they want somebody else to pay for the daycare. Yes, exactly. Literally. That's completely true. They were organizing against childcare because it would take mothers out of the home. And it would take children out of the homes as well, correct. A federalized and Huxleyan system of child rearing actually isn't a good thing. Just as the European countries were starting their childcare systems, we were shutting the door. The day after Nixon vetoes, the CDA, he signs into law a bill that created child care tax deductions for middle class and affluent families. Yes, to make universal child care less of a necessity by lowering the tax burden for families so more of them could afford to have the mother stay at home. That's an absolutely flawless step in the right direction. Smirking about it doesn't make it a bad idea. Even if Vox plays cheeky music over her smirking? Especially! is creates a two-tiered system. On one hand, you have these tax supports, and then on the other hand, you get these much more stigmatized direct supports for only low-income families. Yes, because there's nothing wrong with having less money taken from you, but there is something potentially shameful about taking other people's money without their consent if you do Not only that, how are you going to take less money from people you already can't take money from because they don't make enough money for you to take any from? Right? You're going to fucking you gonna steal money from the welfare cases? They're fucking $300 a month? Like, what, what money are you taking? Don't need it or if it's because of irresponsible decision making. Most folks are more interested in scrutinizing people who are taking money from them rather than those who are getting to keep more of their own money. Meanwhile, these countries were able to follow a path from one universal policy to another. Experts call this path dependency. So for these countries, once they established one universal policy, creating others was fairly straightforward. Yep. Hard to stop a train wreck once it started. Where in the US, it's been easier to design policies within the parameters of the existing income-based programs or the tax breaks that Nixon founded. He set a path where any kind of federal childcare policy would be as underfunded, stigmatized as possible. Unlike the path you would like to put us down, where husbands supporting their wives and women staying home with their children is as stigmatized as possible. It's a system that reinforces um, and deepens inequalities of race, gender, and class. Incorrect. Stable families transcend demographic disparity. Oh my god. The fucking race, gender, and class thing, bro. Bro. Oh my god, how? How do they believe this nonsense? Okay, first of all, 
how does it in any way affect gender or class? Or, or, or sorry, how does it affect race? Let's start with how does it affect race? You, any race can do it. Now, if you're going to get into the class argument, I think you have a somewhat strong argument there in one sense of the fact that, yeah, it's going to be more easy for people who are of a higher upper uh, economic class to do it, right? Which you could argue bleeds into race in some ways because of historical reasons as well as other reasons. And then when you get into gender, it's not. It's just people are just fulfilling their gender roles. The problem is people like this woman have stigmatized female gender roles as being inherently bad, right? Traditional Christians think a stay-at-home mom is just as important as the husband being out there being the breadwinner. You don't, <clears throat> right? The issue isn't them not valuing their wife for work, for being a stay-at-home mom and cooking and cleaning and all of that stuff and raising the kids. The, the issue is you not valuing her for doing that, right? The husband values her a lot for doing that. That's why a lot of guys want stay-at-home wives, right? Especially a lot of, like, traditional Christian guys. It, it's, it's not that the husband doesn't value them. It's you don't value them. And society largely hasn't since I would say probably the 90s. It started in the 70s, but it didn't become the norm until I would say the 90s. And a lot of that is because of the exact cultural things you were talking about as positives. So you're whining about the results of your own fucking decisions. <clears throat> Racial minorities in married couple households are significantly less likely to live in poverty. That's right. The family unit is so strong as an institution that it mitigates the effects of all the pervasive white supremacy under which we live. It's stronger than racism. And yet, wanting to preserve the family by reducing financial strain that married couples with many children might experience in the form of tax cuts, and doing anything and everything necessary to keep the family unit contained rather than splitting it up through various childcare bureaucracies and places of employment, is merely a tactic of those who hate indigenous women. It doesn't end up helping so many of our families. By helping families, she means helping to split them up, by the way. But just because we're on that path doesn't mean we can't change. Have mercy. Just look at the United Kingdom. From a bird's eye view, these countries are following very similar paths. Neither continued the daycare centers after World War II. Both had attempted childcare policies in the 70s. The UK's failed attempt was actually led by conservative Margaret Thatcher. But in the 90s, the UK actually shifted and established a universal pre-K program. So what changed? It's framed as education, not welfare. As is the system in Sweden, where children are expected to be placed into the system at as early as 12 months, and where mothers are rarely able to stay with their children beyond that first year and a half, and when they are, it's deeply stigmatized. And so those questions of deservingness aren't applicable in the same way because it's education for all children. It's part-time, it's not as generous, but I think that it is an example of how you can readjust your priorities and change direction. The U.S. had universal child care once. And my friend lived in a homeless shelter once. Does it mean that's a preferable alternative to what he can have when his life is on track? Similarly, a nation that isn't engaged in an all-encompassing war effort that forces women into dangerous factory jobs and is able to have normal and healthy functioning family units shouldn't opt instead for state centers where children are separated from their mothers for the majority of the day. In conclusion. The underlying assumption of this video is that a system of strangers raising other people's children for them so that worker scarcity can be diminished is not only an acceptable thing for a normal, well-adjusted adult to want, but is in fact a preferable alternative to the family. But all of the data, unsurprisingly, show this to be completely untrue. Within five years of birth, one third of children born to unmarried parents see their father less than once a month and are already showing problems in test performance and behavior. Adolescents whose parents have divorced are more likely to experience injury, accidents, and illness than children from intact families. Furthermore, stable families transcend demographic disparity. Racial minorities in married couple households are significantly less likely to live in poverty. That's right. 
meaning the family's the best thing for battling white supremacy. Families matter more than the state ever will. No government will ever raise a child better than a loving family. And federal funding to child care programs is a crutch. It's a wooden leg to use if somebody has lost theirs. Not something we should all be going to get cosmetic surgery to replace our healthy and functioning legs with. And almost did again. But with policy, it's never really game over. Believe me, if those policies usurp the role of the family, it will be. <laughs> Yeah, th that's the problem with the leftists. It doesn't matter how many times they lose an argument, they'll just keep voting for it until they win. You saw this with uh, Brexit in the UK not too long ago. The Brexiteers obviously won, and then they were calling for another vote immediately, right? It's only democracy if my side wins. Otherwise, it's, you know, populism or whatever other argument they're going to they're gonna make, but... Yeah, you can see <clears throat> right through that girl's religion, right? She's very clearly an intersectionalist. You could tell by the way she was talking, how she brought up race out of nowhere. And, and, and the funniest part was the inconsistency to me, right? White women should be at work. Or sorry, white women, sh you know, white women should be at home. And therefore, they don't, you know, should, should I explain this best? She thinks that conservatives want white women to stay at home. So therefore, they're not willing to allow daycares to exist but also that they want black women at work so they're not willing to allow daycares to exist how does this make sense shouldn't it be one or the other right it's logically inconsistent but anyway let me know what you think like comment subscribe and i'll see you in the next one